Okay, so in the last lesson, we finished with this very stripped down formula, arguably for something that we don't really want. Um, it's been a long journey to get here, and it's all, always with this stuff, as it gets more and more abstractified, we have to always kind of lean back and make contact with, okay, where, what, was, what were we really after, and what do we have, and how are we going to kind of get there? Now, this has all been done before, so it's not like we're going through this the first time. I know where the ending is, so that's the whole point of being a student, is you're talking to somebody who knows where the ending is, especially a, a student of science, at least, right, um, or mathematics. Um, and this topic is quite self-contained. So don't make don't uh, feel shocked if you don't see how immediately how the ending would emerge because believe me nobody does i mean it took the people who actually got to the end um worked very 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 hard for a long time to do it together and now we get to follow their logic so anyway um what we were after is we were after an equation that told us the schwarzschild radius as a function of the of a parameter an affine parameter along the world line. We wanted to know the um, uh, function of the latitudinal angle with that parameter, a function of the azimuthal angle according to that parameter, and a function of the coordinate time according to that parameter, and also in principle a function of the proper time according to that parameter. But, and in some sense, we decided, okay, we're going to make that parameter equal to proper time. So what we really want is a function of the uh, Schwarzschild radius as a function of the proper time, theta as a function of the proper time, phi as a function of the proper time, and the coordinate time as a function of the proper time. Because the coordinate time is a coordinate um, in, the, in the coordinate system on the manifold of space-time. So this is really what we want. And if we knew those four things, we could then take our little planet, or star, which is sort of moving through space-time with one dimension suppressed. I guess we'll continue to assume a spherically symmetric problem where we can easily suppress one spatial dimension. And once we know that, then I can plot using this and this and this, I can plot the path of an object around the star, maybe there's the, an object doing a flyby orbit, right? It does a flyby orbit around the star. It starts unbound and it swings by the star and it leaves unbound. Um, so I'll know rho is a function of time, I'll know theta is a function of time, and I'll know phi is a function of time. And uh, But I'll also, because I know the coordinate time is a function of time, I'll be able to take each point along this path and establish its coordinate time uh, uh, which is this vertical axis, right? This vertical axis is coordinate time. And um, uh, that's, and that's what I really want, right? I want those four expressions. So what have I got, though? What I've got is I've got a differential equation that will give me this abstract thing called phi as a function of the azimuthal angle. And that's okay, because I've actually solved for this, right? I know that that's going to be a constant pi over 2. So I know that answer. So, but, uh, uh, but chi as a function of phi is really, if I know that, remember that chi is, is 1 over the dimensionless Schwarzschild radius, right? So I'm going to have 1 over the dimensionless Schwarzschild radius as a function of the flyby angle, and I don't have time as a function of tau at all, and I don't have anything as a function of tau. I just have everything as a function of each other, right? So it's a it's quite a compromise that I'm at. So let's kind of tear uh, tear that apart just a little bit to see um, if we can get a little closer to what we're after. For right now, however, we are going to settle on this. We, we, we do kind of understand that if I know this, then all I have to do is take 1 over chi, right, and I end up with rho star. So that's good. So this is essentially equivalent to chi. So that's not a big problem. And if I'm really worried about the dimensions, then I just multiply by 
the um, I just multiply by the um, Schwarzschild radius to get my dimensions back. But um, but it's it, the problem is is I'm I'm not really after getting the functions of tau that I really wanted when I set forth on this project. Although I gotta say I'm not too displeased with this. At least I know the shape of the orbit, right? Um, I just don't know how fast things are moving. Now it is true that using this guy, I can make a few other moves, right? For example, I could say that the coordinate time as a function of chi, which is the which would which implies the existence of the independent variable of the coordinate time as a function of the inverse dimensionless Schwarzschild radius considered as a independent variable. So this function existing implies that a derivative exists. I can kind of work that, work the old calculus magic and go, that's, well, that's dt, dt, d lambda, where lambda is some parameter along the world line, right? Because we always assume that you know, there is, the coordinate time is given as a function of some affine parameter along along the world line. And then I could say, well, that's d lambda d phi times d phi d chi, right? So, so uh, if I could do this, if I could figure this stuff out, I, I kind of know this last one, right? This last one is the reciprocal of this, right? So if I put that in the denominator, uh, one, you know, took the reciprocal of this, I'd get this last term. But what are these terms? Well, let's start with d t d tau, where we'll parameterize the path using the proper time along the path, which is something we always do. So d t d tau. Uh, well, we know uh, from the constants of the motion how this is supposed to work, right? We have dt d tau minus 1, what, what did we have? We had alpha over rho equal this constant of the motion kappa. But that is simply, uh, the alpha over rho is simply, let's see, let me, I can erase alpha over rho and I can replace that with 1 over rho star. But what's 1 over rho star? Well, that's um, uh, chi, right? So 1 minus chi equals kappa. So I can now write dt d tau, where tau is our parameter, equals... You've got to come up with a good way of writing kappa. I think I'll try that. A little more... Uh, in, over 1 minus chi. I'll be a little more aggressive with my my uh, ser serifs, I guess is what they are on these things. So I know what dt d tau is because I know a constant of the motion. This shows you how important the constant of the motion is because I can now substitute what I just wrote for this guy where if I take lambda to be the proper time, the way I've decided to do it. But uh, what about the other one? Well, the other one, uh, d phi d lambda, it's the reciprocal of d phi d lambda. I know what d phi d lambda is from the same logic. d phi d tau, because we're going to replace lambda with tau, that times, um, what was it? It was times rho squared is what h was defined as, as a constant of motion. So now I divide by alpha squared and multiply by alpha squared, and I get that equals, um, h equals, uh, well, I'll just call it phi dot, where we'll understand that's the derivative with respect to proper time, and now I have alpha squared rho uh, star, the dimensionless rho squared, right? And so now I can write, uh, well, I better go back to this notation, d, d tau equals, uh, h equals phi dot alpha dot rho d t d tau is going to be h over alpha squared um, divided by chi squared. Is that right? No, that's not right. It's the, this chi squared belongs in the numerator, right? Because it's the reciprocal. So, so this is phi dot alpha squared 
uh, 1 over chi squared. So now you get the chi squared up here, chi squared, right, like, like that. So the reciprocal of this, which is what we're after, right, d tau d phi is alpha squared over h chi squared. And then I can write d t, t d tau times d tau d phi as kappa alpha squared over h uh, chi squared 1 minus chi. I'll just do some erasing here to separate everything out. So that is that factor, this factor here, could go right there, and I know what this is. So I can actually write a differential expression for, or a, 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 an expression for the derivative of the coordinate time with respect to chi. And that would help me a lot with this program, right? Because now uh, I know chi as a, presumably I can solve this somehow and get chi as a function of the true anomaly, so I kind of get the shape of this path, but now I can actually elevate this path correctly off of the plane using the t-coordinate by saying, okay, well, now that I know uh, chi is a function of phi, I just sort of, I can use that. I can solve this equation. Uh, which equation? Where is the equation I want to solve? Uh, I can solve this equation for t is a function of chi, and I can then plot this vertically, and I can kind of get the world line, right? As far, at least I can get the world line as a function of, well, it would be the coordinate time, uh, as a, it's, I'm, I'm still getting it as functions of each other, right? I'm still, it's ultimately a function of the true anomaly, but at least I get the coordinate time as a function of the true anomaly. So that's a lot of progress, actually. But the key is I couldn't have done this without these constants of the motion, right? That's allowing me to take this relatively complex object and substitute this. Um, this, by the way, we can simplify a little bit. The way we simplify it is, let's see, let's work on just the constants, right? We're dealing with kappa alpha squared over h. So that will be kappa over h times 4m squared, which is going to be uh, 2m. I kind of know how this is going to work out, so that's why I'm breaking it up the way I'm breaking it up. 2m, m over h times 2 kappa, which is 2m times 2s kappa, right? Because that is defined as s, right? But this thing, if you remember back to this version of the differential equation, a, a was defined as that guy was equal to uh, 4s squared kappa squared. So a is a will be 2s kappa, right? a is 2s kappa. So with that in mind, that's what that 2s kappa is. So this is going to be 2ma. So this whole thing will be 2ma over chi. Oh, chi is looking better, but chi squared 1 minus chi. Every time I say chi squared, I keep thinking of statistics. Um, <clears throat> of course, this has utterly nothing to do with statistics. So now I know how this, exp I, this, I know what that expression is. It's simply that, right? It's simply that. It's a straightforward function of chi. So I can go back to this, dt d chi, dt d d lambda, d lambda, d chi. Now I take lambda to be uh, tau. That wasn't critical, by the way. Taking lambda to be tau was not critical. This would have made sense for any parameterization uh, of the path. So uh, then I take this guy here, and I substitute 1 over this. I'll choose to use this form since we're playing around with the a. So 1 over this, and that's what this is, right? And then this part here, these two, it's this part right here, right? And so uh, 
now I have a differential function, a differential equation for the coordinate time as a function of the coordinate uh, uh, radial variable, which is actually the inverse Schwarzschild radius in unitless form. So that's cool. That's good. Um, that now, uh, with that, will allow me to calculate the uh, this ordinate point, right? This this vertical lift off of the plane. So getting uh, solving this for chi is a function of phi, and then sort of working it so I get back to my Schwarzschild radius will allow me to get the two-dimensional shape of the orbit, and then I'll be able to elevate each point once I know the radial distance of each point. I'll be able to elevate it and, and calculate the coordinate time. So I'll know when this particle hits everything. Uh, I'll know when, in coordinate time, this particle will hit everything. And then presumably, if I just integrate along that path, I can find the proper time for that, too. So that's good, although everything is still sort of in terms of the... Ultimately, it's in terms of the uh, true anomaly. In other words, I have t of chi of phi, right? That's I've got this sort of... I guess the way you would write that is uh, uh, t after chi, where chi is known to be a function of phi. So this is all a function of phi. So the name of that would be t after chi, something like that. Okay, so um, uh, so there's a, something we can do. And we can also do one other um, uh, easy, easy, uh, easy fix. Or easy new differential equation. Let me let's do the second. Let's do one more. Well, the, I guess the other one is the, the next one is actually pretty simple. What about what about that proper time, right? I want to write the proper time as a function of the radial, or well, what we're calling the radial variable. I'll call this the radial variable, so I don't have to keep saying um, the inverse of the Schwarzschild radius in unitless measure. I'll just call it the radial variable, but it is chi. So you have to understand, well, always remember that chi is 1 over rho star, which is alpha over rho. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, uh, d tau d chi is not very difficult because d tau d, we just using the same sort of miraculous calculus, right? It's always seemed to me, as I was learning this elementary calculus is just a little too easy to use these um, this, this Leibniz notation. But um, it's dt d lambda for any parameterization, d lambda d phi, and then d phi d uh, chi. Right? So, so but, so, so this whole part is just that, and d the proper time's relationship with the coordinate time. Well, that's what uh, that's what that's that's from from special relativity. We know that that's equal to one over the total energy, right? So all we have to do is add, basically, add an e in the denominator there, and we've got the proper time uh, with respect to the... We, we now have a function of the proper time with respect to the, uh, with this, the radial variable. So that's not so bad. So at least we have all of this. So but, uh, I'm, we're still faced with the horrible problem, though, of solving this differential equation and this differential equation, right? We haven't gotten away from that. We've made no, you know, we're not making illusions that any of these changes are making our life necessarily simpler. Um, all these differential equations are equivalent. So, so thinking about solving them really is, uh, is, is still looming large in front of us. So let's actually try to make some progress regarding the actual solution of this. Uh, I, we're not going to go too far in that direction right now, but there is a... Uh, uh, one technique that just pops out of um, the history of the cubic equation that will get us pretty quickly to something that can be understood as a solution. Of course, nothing's easy, and it involves another substitution. 
we have to create a new variable, which I'll call capital U. And capital U has this interesting and historically famous form for those who are students of algebra and for those who have studied the cubic equation uh, like most of us have studied the quadratic equation. This is a very famous substitution for a cubic equation. If you make this substitution, we're going to make the substitution for chi, we're going to convert it to u, right? So we're literally going to replace chi everywhere to create a new equation in, uh, in terms of u. It turns out this famous substitution will eliminate, will eliminate the second order term of the cubic equation. And then you have what is called a depressed cubic. A depressed, depressed cubic. So in other words, a standard cubic equation will be something like ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. If b equals zero and this term is, goes away, then you have a depressed cubic. And any... Uh, cubic equation can be turned into a depressed cubic equation by making this substitution. Uh, a bit of a little algebra miracle, I guess. Actually, just to be clear, if this is term is gone, the depressed cubic equation is actually this, x cubed plus, I guess it would be something like c over a x plus d over a equals zero. In other words, it's x cubed plus uh, some constant c1 times x plus c2 equals zero. That's a depressed cubic equation, right? If, if this a is up there, it's technically not totally depressed. But the point is, is that substitution will get rid of that square term. Um, if you go back to the study of like the history of algebra, the, some medieval guy figured this out and kept it around as like a really, really big secret. It was a really, really big secret about how to do that. And ultimately, solving the true cubic equation, uh, this was a, a huge step in solving the, tr the cubic equation, was understanding how to turn it into a depressed cubic equation. Anyway, if you make this substitution, right, uh, to, to make the substitution, you need to be able to write d chi equals uh, uh, 4du, right? And to make the substitution, you'll end up with essentially 16, I'll just start it, because it's a very long process, but 16 du d chi squared, and then this is going to be uh, 1 third plus 4u cubed, minus one third plus four u squared plus four s squared one third plus four u plus uh, uh, I guess nothing happens over there um, it's four s squared uh, kappa squared minus one so you can see what you have to do here, right? You have to expand this as a cube, cubic. You have to expand this as a quadratic. And then when you add up all the terms together, you'll finally end up with the following expression. Uh, this thing here, which I've written out. So you can see, you know, you're going to, you can kind of check, right? One third, you know that this cube will give you one twenty-seventh, and this square will give you one ninth. Um, as far as pure numbers go, that's going to be the only pure number, which is this thing here is the only pure number. So one ninth, um, uh, one twenty seventh, one ninth will be minus two twenty seventh divided by sixteen, and ends up being one over two hundred sixteen. So you end up with this expression, which isn't quite a depressed cubic because of this factor of four, right? That's what I was kind of saying. Uh, well, I guess I erased it, but that factor of 4, it's not quite a decrest cubic, but it is missing any quadratic term in u. So now <laughs> you've got u equals uh, 1 fourth. This is just to keep track of where we are, right? 1 fourth, we got chi minus 1 third. Chi minus 1 third, which is 1 fourth of 1 over rho star minus 1 third, 
which uh, is one, you know, that's close enough, that's far. So it's still a form of the reciprocal of the Schwarzschild radius, but now it's a it's offset linearly by, you know, there's some uh, straight up additive offset of minus one twelfth, and there's a scale offset of a fourth, right? So now you're solving. You've got a differential equation in this form, but you're solving for something even weirder. And and you could easily ask, well, so what's the benefit, right? What's the benefit? The answer to what is the benefit comes from the fact that. Um, I am aware, because I'm very, very knowledgeable about mathematical, the functions of, the special functions of mathematics, you know, the mathematical subject of special functions, I know that this differential equation, minus G2U minus G3, right, this differential equation, we actually know what the answer is. We know what the answer is. And let me just quickly show you that answer. So to find the answer, we turn to the famous reference textbook, uh, reference book for mathematical functions and special functions in mathematics, uh, Abronovitz and Stengun. This is available online. And uh, it's also, most of us have accumulated a hard copy at one point or another, but it's maintained at the National Institute of Standards. And it's basically chapter 18, uh, has is titled uh, uh, Weierstrauss elliptic and related functions. Weierstrauss, Weierstrauss. Not sure how to pronounce it, but uh, the this chapter is a pretty esoteric chapter that you probably have never read, right? And hey, you know, I never read it until I got to this problem. But if you go to this first section of this chapter you see the definition of the Weierstrauss um, p function, the p function, and it's an elliptic function, which is, again, another thing that we don't usually study um, as physicists. We don't usually study this kind of mathematics, um, uh, or at least, well, not necessarily. Uh, at, certainly at the graduate level, you almost inevitably run, run into it. But even if you did, the Weierstrass piece function you may not run into. You may run into the Jacobi elliptic functions and elliptic integrals, which we'll probably talk about eventually here too soon. But this function, this Weierstrass elliptic function, fundamental differential equations, discriminant, and related quantities. Well, there's the fundamental dis differential equation. The, der the square of the derivative of this function with respect to its independent variable is 4 times its cube minus g2 times pz minus g3. So in our world, g2 is simply, uh, well, there's our 4, right? But in our world, g2 is this guy, and g3 is that guy. So given our problem, we're presumably given s and given k, and from that we calculate g3 and g2, and now we have found a differential equation whose answer we know. We know that the answer to this differential equation is the p function, the Weierstrass p function, as a function of phi. Um, that's what, basically that's what u equals. u will equal that thing. So a deep knowledge of this stuff kind of comes in handy right here. Now, what else do we see? Well, so this is the differential equation. Uh, let me, maybe I can blow this up. This is the differential equation satisfied by the p function, and it's exactly our differential equation. Uh, just to make sure, see the two minus signs, g2, g3, we know what this is, perfect form. That's four, by the way, it's not a depressed cubic. It's, uh, it's got, because it's got that four, right? But it also has this form, which is pretty trivial, right? If I if I pull out a factor of 4 from everything here, then um, I assume the roots. I end up with this root form. So I'm just assuming that I can find the roots of this cubic, and then uh, I just throw down this 4 in front, and that's the standard form. It's still the differential equation, right? Up front here, this is a, a scripty p prime squared, right? That comes down there. So that's another form of the uh, differential equation. 
but this form emphasizes the roots. And then it shows the connection, the rest of these equations are trying to show the connection between these things which are called the invariants with respect to the roots. What's the relationship between the invariants and the roots? And um, it d defines the discriminant of this object, and the discriminant can be calculated in terms of these two invariants or in terms of these roots. It turns out the discriminant ends up being um, calculated by the difference between the roots, right? The difference of between the first root and the second root, the third root and the first root, the second root and the third root. And then it t finds the relationship of between the discriminant and the roots. If you know the roots, you can calculate, I'm sorry, the invariance and the roots. If you know uh, the roots, you can calculate the invariance. And, um, uh, and um, so, yeah, so there you have it. So you have all these connections, right? Uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot known about this function, right? There's a tremendous amount known about this function. But in the end, the, the big point is, is if I have a differential equation in this form, I know the answer is going to be the Weierstrass p function. And so in that sense, we've solved our problem, or we've solved a lot of our problem, right? Because now, if I know that, if I know this is true, then I say, well, that's going to equal... And I go back to one fourth chi minus one third, one fourth chi minus one third. Oh, is that fourth in the front? Yeah, that fourth in the front, right? So it's one fourth chi minus one twelfth, uh, one twelfth, right? Because the, and then um, I say, oh, okay, well, uh, <clears throat> so now I'm writing. I I convert this to. Uh, P of phi, P of phi plus one twelfth, right, times four equals chi, and then I say, all right, so now I, I take the um, uh, reciprocal of this, and I go uh, rho star, our Schwarzschild radius, is one fourth, Weierstrauss function plus, that's a twelfth, right? Plus one twelfth to the minus one. And then I multiply by alpha to get the Schwarzschild radius. And so what do I do? I put uh, an alpha right up here. And there is the Schwarzschild radius as a function of phi, right? And so uh, all I have to do is understand Phi. I, I, not as I have to understand the p-function. If I can calculate the p-function, then I'm good. But of course, you can imagine this book is full of ways of calculating the p-function. But of course, so for here, here it is, right? That on this section, uh, if you look at the series expansion of the p-function, here's the Lorentz series of uh, the p of the series expansion of p-function. Now, this book always talks about. Uh, Abramovitz and Stengun always talk about these special functions in terms of a single complex variable. Um, but uh, we're clearly only interested in a real variable, but that's really no big deal. Um, here, uh, uh, they define C2 and C3 for the first values of CK. Maybe I should blow this up a little bit. They define C2 and C3 for the first values of CK, and then CK after that with the sort of the seed values of C2 and C3. But in case you're really lazy, then they give you all of the different values of these various things. C12, I mean, here, C14 is this big number times C2 to the sixth power, C2 to the third power, C3. So it's polynomials in C2 and C3, rational polynomials of C2 and C2 and C3. So with this and with the Lorentz series, you can calculate p, and that's your answer. That is the orbit. That is the orbit of um, uh, that. That will give you the shape of the orbit in the Schwarzschild spacetime. And I promise you, it's no conic section, right? It's going to be a lot more interesting than that. So uh, that gets us pretty far along. Let me see what the, the next subject will be. Okay. So in the next lesson, we will probably return to the factored form of this equation. Let's see if I can find a 
find it here. We'll try to return to the factor form, and we'll start understanding how to interpret uh, this equation. Matter of fact, we'll go to both of these forms, and we'll talk about interpreting how to understand the significance of the roots and what they mean for the shapes of the orbits. All right, see you next time.